So now something completely different. Uh, first of all, I like to I like to say I'm happy to see so many broke people in one room. Uh, I think together we are stronger. If we pull together our money, we can maybe actually do something. Um, so let's start. Let's start with the, with the topic. Um, how I got the uh, inspiration for this presentation was when actually reading this amazing data engineering book, uh, which I would recommend to anybody anywhere in the data domain. It's called Data Intensive Designing Data Intensive Applications. Uh, and somewhere on, in the beginning of the chapter on storage and retrieval, explaining how we get to these very complex databases that you have in the end, uh, they start by explaining what is the actual minimal database. So what would be like a six-line uh, six shell implementation of, uh, let's say, of a viable key value store. And then the authors go and explain through various steps on how we build up to something that looks more like SQL Server or uh, Postgres. So I decided to steal this approach. I think it's a very good uh, didactic tool trick and to apply the same on building, let's say, a minimal machine learning operations platform. Let's see how that works. Uh, what's the motivation for this? Well, we all constantly operate on certain budgets. So even if you're in a very rich industry and your company has a lot of money, we only have 24 hours, right, in the day, all of us. Uh, and also, there are often very big uh, capacity, uh, capacity limitations. So sometimes uh, you don't have all these amazing engineers like the Nosh guys, which are able to build out this whole platform for you. Or maybe, I don't know, we didn't ask them how long it took. If it takes two years to build such an amazing platform, you need to do something in the meantime, okay? Um, and so I say, if you are the cool rich kids with the MLOps platform, I would say, go for it, stay with it. I'm fully in support of end-to-end -end platforms. Uh, but you never know when the time will come to maybe, you know, roll up your sleeves and actually have to do some kind of uh, more grunt work and, and, and ground, ground work. Uh, for the rest of us, you know, we have to follow the wise words of uh, Mr. Bear Grylls, improvise, adapt, overcome. So, uh, one of the first choices you have to make uh, is where you're going to host this thing that you're building. So, it's uh, on-premise is not so terrible. <laughs> I work mainly on premise, uh, but I would say that for a beginning team, if you're starting from scratch, I would say go to the cloud. It's much more flexible, accessible, uh, unless you already have something on premise. But really, the debate here is not over yet, and even in the last years, uh, it's being more and more. You have more and more voices which are advocating actually for specific use cases to go back to on premise. In this talk, we're going to go with the cloud approach, especially if you're a small team, you cannot now hire a whole platform team, which you would need for on-premise engineering. Okay, so that's immediately a no-go if there's like 10 of you, 10 of you, sorry. Um, so let's start with like a really uh, scandalous, obnoxious idea of running a whole machine learning platform on our own laptop. Let's say I got this brilliant idea. I'm going to make a startup. I'm going to make a flower classification API, and I have this brilliant idea. I'm going to sell this. And I quit my job, of course, and I ask ChatGPT after I quit my job, hey, how do I actually build this thing? Uh, and in some 50, 60 lines of code, ChatGPT gives me a way how to train my model on the famous Iris data set. You know, nobody needs big data anyway. So I train my Iris classification model and I serve it via the API. And as you know, uh, a laptop is a computer and a server is a computer with access to internet. So why wouldn't I serve my paying uh, service via the laptop? Why not? So I start doing it like that. And, uh, but I notice at a certain point when my son plays video games, I see that my clients start calling me and saying, hey man, you know, this is down. Or if he, if he doesn't plug in the, the, the charger, then it go, the whole service goes down and I have no more revenue. So I realized, okay, I have to improve something. So I need to separate my development environment, which is where I build my application from my production environment. I need a dedicated production environment so that my flower classification API can work autonomously without any disturbance. And uh, because MLOps is all about automation, right? We make a little automation script for deploying this, which simply takes my code from my development uh, laptop, SSH, uh, SCPs it into the, into the target machine, runs a couple of setup commands, and starts it, of course, in a no hookup mode so that it does not stop when I disconnect. You have to be careful of that. And I have my production environment. I can I serve my API. My son can play video games. It's all perfect. Good. I guess that's the end of the story. Thank you. Thank you. So, so what do we do now? 
tech, I mean, technically, philosophically, you could argue you're now doing MLOps. You're serving your model, you're earning your money, so why change anything? Well, this boat has a lot of holes, and you need to start fixing some of them. So again, you can choose two paths. You can say, I want to go for more for my own developer experience, or I can go more for the user experience because in the end, they are the ones paying for my API. So one of the first things you would say you would, you would implement there is some kind of monitoring. In the simplest, most simple way, you could, again, just you can make a bash script with certain number of checks. For example, first of all, is my application running? Is my API responsive? Because you can have a zombie application which, where the process is running, but the API is not responsive. Or you can have both, and your logging is not working, which still is not a good thing. And uh, in an amazing number of cases, so of course, you raise the alert, you send an email from the Linux server, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to set up, and we restart the application. We hope that this is going to help until we debug the, the, whole, uh, the root cause of the issue. And amazingly, in many of these cases, a simple restart really does the trick, still, in 2023. Um, so, of course, you need to schedule this. This needs to be on this production platform. You have to have this monitoring script. And you say, OK, I want this to run every minute. If something happens, I get an email whenever. And, uh, and that's, uh, that's it. But of course, uh, since we're talking about machine learning products, it's not enough that you're service is running, you also want to monitor certain ML-related metrics. So you want to check, in the most basic sense, you want to check the, the, the data drift, you want the input distribution, output distribution. Of course, we did not break down how you would write this function. Of course, it doesn't have to be bash. I would not write, I would not write it in bash. But this, consider this just as a simple glue script. Anyway, you have this, uh, this ML monitoring script, which does not need to restart anything because it's not really an action to take uh, if uh, you just have some data drift. And you don't have to run this probably every minute, but let's say you run this every day just to, to lower the burden if it's a compute-intensive task. Uh, and one more thing when, uh, when doing the monitoring, um, it's a good to have an external service to check if your API is alive because if your machine dies, it cannot check if it's alive, of course. I think it makes sense. Good. Um, and so, can we, again, at every step we ask, can we stop now? Can I just leave this whole architecture as that and go home? Well, I would say if you're a lone, lonesome cowboy and this is your own pet project, feel free, I mean, stop it here, you don't have to, you don't have to go any further. Fine, but the moment you have two plus cowboys in your team that now all need to start pushing their code that have the idea we are all gonna push our code to production, uh, things become tricky. And, and you quickly come into the whole blame game. Uh, who put this code in production? Who broke this? You deployed it. No, but you made the code change. So how do we resolve this? Well, it's a very simple, very simple answer. CI CD platforms. You maybe noticed I didn't mention Git so far. Well, here it comes. Basically, uh, why we have all these, the main purpose of this nice, the main, one of the main purposes of this nice uh, CI CD slash DevOps platforms is to be the single source of truth and an audit trail of all the changes that happened in our code. So this is where we, you do the merge code, you, deal, you do the builds and everything. So in the beginning, it was only for code merging. But meanwhile, you see that these platforms have grown into like full, full platforms, full DevOps platforms, where we can also see who reviewed what, who approved which change. Uh, we can see who clicked to deploy. We can set even governance to say, uh, no, this thing should not be deployed to production unless Two people, three people uh, need to approve it, and then you have this, uh, I would say, a layer layer of uh, of governance, which is which is very needed. Good, um, and the good thing is that the, this deploy bash script, which you hopefully develop to be reusable, you can now put it here, and your DevOps platform, if you, even if you have a very customized uh, deployment process, you can just reuse it and say, okay, hey GitLab, run this, put this artifact where it needs to go into production, and and it's all good. Perfect. Now, the big missing part, which you have maybe noticed, so far we talked almost only about DevOps. We didn't talk about MLOps. <laughs> so what about the data? What about the models? Um, the same goes, so it, I cannot stress this enough, but if you're not versioning your data, you're not versioning your code. In, if you're doing machine learning and you have no idea from which data set you created something, remember that we always say machine learning is programming 2.0, is programming without explicitly coding. 
So your data gets turned into if else statements or whatever. So if, if you don't know where this came from, you're, you're practically clueless. Um, luckily, it's, it's not a difficult thing. You have open source tools like DVC, and you can use a simple S3 bucket or blob storage on, on Azure, whatever. Um, and you can, and you should absolutely version the raw data, the process data, the final training data. And this is a place from which all the developers, of course, should pull the data and push it to. The same like you do with Git, that's, that's the point of it. Um, and then we come to this, I would say, um, the main boss, like if this was a video game, uh, the main boss of MLOps, uh, uh, the, the crown jewel, uh, which is, I would say, reproducible model training, which has, has a lot of difficulties, I would say, in, in being implemented. So essentially, it's very simple. To have reproducible model training, uh, you should simply check out your latest code with which you want to train your model. You should check out the data to which that code points to, that, to, that it wants to use. Um, not copy anything, not move anything, not use some kind of a shared folder, which no, God knows who put what there and when. Uh, you train it and you serve the, you, you, sorry, you save the resulting model in some kind of a artifact model registry. Um, but the trick is you need to do, you should do this, all this through the CI-CD platform. Even if it's not executed on the platform, it should somehow be triggered by the platform. So I, I know some people, for example, have a paid uh, platform, like one of the vendors, I'm not going to advertise anybody, which they trigger through their uh, Azure DevOps or GitLab or whatever. So it's still, still the control tower is in the, in the central platform. Um, but then you often have the cases with, uh, because sometimes model training takes a lot and people really think their model is really amazing. And they say, oh, but I already trained this model. I, I made it on my local machine. So uh, why don't I just push this model? Why don't I just put it on Git? You can even merge, version smaller models on Git. It's not a problem. Um, so why can't I ju just, just use this thing I already have built and which I shown to the business and business says, this is a very good model, let's deploy it. Um, the problem is that the rest of your team, your bosses and everybody, nobody knows, uh, have you really committed all that code before you trained? Uh, did you commit the, ver the data set before you trained? Uh, do we know the Python environment in which you trained? You know, because uh, recently I had an example, we tried to load models from scikit-learn 0.24 with scikit-learn 1.1, and the performance was, I think, 100 times uh, worse, so slower. You know, so these are, you, you cannot just deploy something, a, a pickle file, especially because Pickle is a very unsecure uh, format, which allows executing um, random code on your computer. So you need, to, you need to know very well how this model was trained. Um, and finally, like a model metadata, there's a whole host of issues. So bottom line, if you really want really proper reproducible model training, you need to run it somehow through the CI platform. Of course, since it takes time, it takes time for you to, to build it up uh, with everything, I would say if you are temporarily forced to do it somehow manually, have a process around it, have something like a four eyes principle or, or some kind of, uh, let's say, local automation script, which does the whole process, which ensures something we did, for example, is to have like a separate little application, which locally checks out everything and verifies that the code is committed. So there is no uh, uh, person running it's triggered so that the application does some kind of a local build of the model. That's a, that's a work, temporary workaround that uh, that can be acceptable. Still, it should not become the way you do things. Otherwise, you're really not you don't have reproducible models. And in one or two years, you're gonna wonder what did I put in production? Okay. So, luckily, uh, a model registry. So, training, as I said, is can be a bit difficult to set up. But the model registry, as uh, Alexei showed yesterday, can be a simple S3 bucket, and I would advise that for the beginning. I think that's a, that's a completely uh, completely decent uh, start. Of course, with its own set of policies, uh, not the same bucket for the data repository, and you, you need to you need to configure this in a in a proper way. Um, what big component are we still missing? What would you say? What would you add here? I th I would expect Alexei to winch. <laughs> <laughs> to get nervous ticks, which environment are we missing? I would say the test or the staging. So the, I think I think this is the, the last missing piece you would need to uh, to round up this this whole thing, this minimal minimal architecture. Uh, 
if you have not come across this, I know that it took me a while, like I worked in academia and here and there to understand what are all these environments. But yeah, basically you have the place where you develop, you have the place where you run, and the test is where you test and stage and integrate before you run. Uh, of course, so that you can fully test, it should be a copy, as close as a possible a copy of the production environment, where you can, which you can basically burn and crash without disturbing the production. That's basically the idea of the test environment. Altogether, you can see it like this. I put some symbols of these cloud platforms. You don't have to go there. Uh, I think the only thing which I uh, here put as, um, I said you should not go too simple with it, but like the MLOps, the DevOps platforms, I think they are so developed right now and they are pretty, pretty cheap and affordable. I think it does not make any sense to start making up some kind of uh, CI CD platform on your own. I think it's completely unreasonable. So we should be, how should I say, minimal with, with reason, of course. If something is cheap and, and, and good, so I would absolutely go for it. Um, there are many things we didn't cover, of course. So you, you heard the guys from Nosh before what a full-blown data science, data engineering MLS platform looks like. I, again, I would like to hear them later how much it took them because that, that, that looks like a really, really uh, gigantic endeavor. So we didn't mention feature stores, uh, vector databases, uh, how to store metadata for ML monitoring, labeling tools. For example, we talked in general about uh, data versioning, but you need label audit trails because every labeler that touches your data is your code contributor, you know? And, and you can see often when you have humans labeling your data, uh, suddenly the business complains, oh, this is not good, this is predictions are bad. And then you go and analyze your data set and uh, you see that, uh, is it called confident learning? I think uh, you can analyze your data and see that, okay, but the labelers were confusing my model. And you can even with some nice little strategies, you can find who did it. But you need to first know you need to have, I would say, the timestamp and, and the social security number of every person that touched your data set. Otherwise, again, you cannot do this whole, <laughs> the blame game, the Git blame game. Um, we didn't touch massive models. Massive models are um, LLMs. Uh, and we did not, this is a completely different engineering challenge. In terms of serving, in terms of training, in terms of monitoring, this is, this is a domain of its own. So don't think you can just apply this to that, just a disclaimer. Um, and one thing we also didn't mention is how to develop with ops in mind. The colleagues before also mentioned it, and, and we know this, this, that it's a no-go to throw a model over the fence. And so you should definitely think about integrating, like thinking about deployment from the very uh, start of your, of your development. Security and everything, I guess cybersecurity guys, if they see this, you know, um, they're getting nervous ticks probably. But uh, yeah, as again, this is a minimal, this is not a recipe, this is a minimal, this is a Exercise in prioritization, that's how I would call it. Okay, good. So, just to give a little summary, um, when machine learning goes to operations, uh, you're, you're in the kingdom of software, hardcore software engineering, you're not in Kansas anymore. Um, and the, the hard part is that ML workflows are um, often retrofitted to, to standard DevOps. That's something which, especially if you have a company which, uh, which is, has started its DevOps journey a long time ago, it's harder to change than if you're starting from scratch. So sometimes being a newcomer is, is to your advantage. Uh, and also we can see that a lot of complexity of DevOps and MLOps comes from the governance part. I like to call it cover your ass ops. Um, but it doesn't also have to be super complicated. Yeah. And um, so regarding the team organization, something we saw in our team is that it's good to, I think we have like a three to one ratio of data scientists to ML engineers. And they are, we are working really tightly together. And from the very beginning, we are reviewing each other's code, we are integrating everything, and I think that's a very good way to do it. Um, uh, I'm, I'm a lot ahead of time, so we'll have more time for Q&A. And I would just say, if you like this kind of work, I'm not allowed to say it, read between the lines. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. Thank you. So I'm just curious, let's say I start a startup, right? Yes. And Don't I, do it. <laughs> it's too late. I have a startup, right? You quit your job. Oh, yeah. Wait. <laughs> and yeah, we solve some business problems and we realize we need a machine learning platform. Yeah. Right? So what do you suggest we should 
use, what kind of criteria when selecting which components of the platform we need. Other set of questions we can ask to, let's say, figure out if we need a feature store or we don't. Like, what's your? I, I think it really depends on the on the types of workloads on what you're processing. Because, for example, I shown here I was talking about the use case with with an API. Uh, what the guys before showed was um, a batch processing. So I think in batch processing, and with very fast with low latency uh, requirements, you need to the feature store makes more sense. It depends how many users you have. If your API is being reached, it's being called once in, in a minute, you don't have a big pressure. So uh, I, I think you really need to analyze. In general, I think you should, you should think about not getting locked in. I, I think you should also, counterintuitive maybe to what I was saying all the time, I support buying. I really support buying tools. I support uh, when it's clever to build tools. But in, in general, I think it's important that all the pieces of your our architecture are interchangeable. That you don't have a big, a big lock-in. That's it. I would say that's the main mm -hmm. criterion. Mm -hmm. Okay. And when it comes to selecting features, as you said, we'll look at our workloads and decide yeah, yeah. which kind of features of yeah. the platform makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's, it's like what kind of storage do you need? What kind of? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's mainly you, you would want to serve the clients first. You know, you mainly care about your SLA, your service level agreement, and are they your clients? Uh, you know, okay with it? And uh, yeah, and go from there. Yeah. So. You said you support buying tools. And yeah. the question from Felipe is, have you ever used tools like Azure ML, Databricks, or SageMaker? And so what do you think about these tools? Do they I simplify? Have used them. I have envelopes? used them. Uh, I didn't use them uh, in a work environment. I use them personally. I like them. I think this, these are all good options. You know, So you just need to see how they can be integrated into your, into your mm -hmm. environment, how much it costs. Because you know, also you need to be very wary of the cloud costs. And uh, again, you know, the presentation was MLOps on a shoestring. So if you suddenly want to train LLMs on a SageMaker, it could be cheaper maybe to build your own rig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, SageMaker is very expensive. Yeah. So. Okay. So a question from Greg is how I should structure my machine learning training pipelines. Should I use orchestrators like? Airflow, Prefect, and so on, or I can rely on uh, CI/CD tools like GitHub, GitLab. Uh, I would always prefer using the right tools for the job, mm -hmm. right? If you have a, like a big data pipeline, I think just look again at the presentation the guys <laughs> delivered before me. Mm -hmm. I think it's very good. It explains like really what happens with a very complex pipeline. Uh, if you have a very simple pipeline, I think you can go through the through the standard DevOps and trigger it. But the more, complex, the more complex a workload becomes, the more you need specialized tools for it. I think, I think that's clear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So GitLab, CI, CD is not always I, the best tool. Yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it should be, in a way, in my, just my opinion, is that it, it should be used as a control tower. Mm -hmm. And then it can call different things. Mm -hmm. So it can trigger like data prep through the platform or everything. But I don't know how you would really reuse it as a data prep tool. I don't yeah. see that. Yeah. And a uh, question about GitLab CI CD that it feels like it's lagging behind its competitors like GitHub Actions and Azure DevOps. What's your opinion about that? I don't have really in depth knowledge of all the platforms. I think they're all very tightly competing with each other. Uh, pr personally, I like GitHub the most, personally. Mm -hmm. But I used also Azure DevOps. Without any problems, I used GitLab without GitLab without any problems. So, I think the differences are not not worth yeah. so much. Yeah, GitHub is great for personal projects. Sorry, yeah. GitHub is great for personal yeah. projects. Indeed, it's free, that's right? what I say. When I used it personally, I could easily quickly configure things, and it, you can integrate it with any cloud. And so, 